I did kind of come up with like a checklist for printing a book. So you, you're, you have your files ready or almost ready. You're thinking about it, but what do you do then? What kind of questions, what do you need to know to get to the printing point? Let me welcome you all today. I've got a special speaker, Kristen Cronenberg Beatty. She has been my go-to for small print runs with a lot of my authors. Lots of questions about, okay, if I want to do some a small print run for my local events, or if I want to print in bulk, you know, where are some of the places I go? What kinds of binding do I need? Do I need... Uh, dust cover. And there's so many different terms and different things that are constantly asked that when I was on the phone recently with Kristen, I said, you should come and join me. And that's why we're here today. We're inviting the whole crew to kind of get your answers. Kristen's here. We can put her to the test and she can talk all about Formax printing. So Kristen, why don't you introduce yourself Tell us a little bit about you, how you got involved with uh, in, in what role you play at Formax and a little about the company. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. So my name is Kristen Cronenberg, but it also says Kristen Beatty. Uh, I did get married, so that might be confusing. And I am an account representative here at Formax. I like to think that printing is kind of in my blood because my father actually started Formax back in the 80s. So, you know, we started off as a form company and then we eventually transitioned throughout the years into a company. Now we do maps, lamination, but our sweet spot is really books. That's our niche. So that's what we really focus on. I've been here for about nine years almost. And so I mainly focus with a lot of children's author and then just authors in general. So it helps me kind of narrow down the specs that you guys would typically use and then kind of help you point you in the right direction, whether that's making something more affordable, something more high quality. There's different options we can do. So I like to work one-on-one with each person to kind of achieve that so that you can eventually achieve your dreams then. So that's just a little snippet about me and Formax. I did kind of come up with like a checklist for printing a book. So you, you're, you have your files ready or almost ready. You're thinking about it. but what do you do then? What kind of questions, what do you need to know to get to the printing point? So based on that checklist, what we need for books is everything is made to order. So everything's custom. If you want certain specs, we can work with you to make that happen. Not all books are the exact same. So with that said, there's a few different things to keep in mind. So first we have the quantity. So you may be ready to do 25 books. You may want to do 500 or 5,000. But depending on the kind of a quantity that you would want, that will now dictate what direction we go. So it might be on a different press. You want to go super high quality. That could be a different option, but it's going to cost more. So it kind of starts with your quantity. So even if you don't know exactly what quantity that you want, I would suggest maybe getting like a range. So hey, I might be interested in 50 to 500. And that's totally possible. We can always go from there. Just something to keep in mind is that as a rule of thumb, the higher the quantity, then the lower the per piece price. So it's kind of this game you have to play, unfortunately. But we will, you know, if we need to requote different quantities and such, it's completely doable and completely understandable. So that's the first one is quantity. And then so the next one on my checklist would be page count. It's kind of weird. I know it sounds simple. But it's like how many pages are in your book? But when it comes down to it, there's a lot of miscommunications about it. When you're flipping through a book and you see you know, this sheet and then the next sheet, the biggest miscommunication is this sheet. There's the front side and then there's a back side. So this whole piece of paper is considered one sheet, but it equals two pages, the front page and the back page. Now, it's super easy to get mixed up. I have 20 sheets or I have 20 pages. And that, if you get that mixed up, that can be a big difference in your pricing, kind of messes up everything. So it's really important to get that narrowed down. But like I said, even if it's a blank in there, it's still going to count as a page. 
So you still count it, even though there's no printing on it or anything. So you would want us to come up with the number of pages, Mm -hmm. including that. So it's each side in one page and pull that together. Typically, what I see is 32 pages, 36 pages. Those, Those are the most common with the eight and a half by eight and a half size for most of my children's authors. Yes, definitely. And if it's easier, sometimes you could think of is if I have 10 pages, that would equal five double sided sheets. So it's just kind of important to remember one sheet equals two pages okay. um, and that can go a long way. So and then so after page count, we have dimensions. Like you said, the for children's book, the biggest or the most common size is eight and a half by eight and a half by far. But that doesn't mean it's limited to just that. We can do just about any custom size. Uh, You know, if you want 8.25 by 8.25, we can do that too. It's just important to note that when you are ready to do this for your checklist is that you note the width first, then the height. So if it's, you know, eight and a half by 11, eight and a half would be width, 11 the height. If you reverse those, now you have a landscape book and that changes up everything. So your pricing typically on a landscape is going to be more expensive. So it's just important to narrow that down. So there's no issues moving forward then. And then the next part is the ink would be the next one. So with a children's book, I'd imagine most do print full color throughout. But if they don't say you're doing like a coloring book or an activity book with it, it just prints black ink only. That makes a big difference in pricing because black ink only is much, much more cost effective. But sometimes that's not the look like, you know, for a children's book, you want to see all the colors. So that's just a really big, important detail to remember when getting something quoted. And then the next one is the paper itself. And I know it can seem like a foreign language and I completely understand that. It comes down to a few different things is texture thickness, and then the sheen level. There's three main types of paper. There's uncoated. So that's going to be great if you want to do an activity book, a journal, a coloring book, something you're going to write on. There's no coating on it. It's not going to smear. It's just for main purposes writing on. So the next one would be a matte stock. So mats are commonly mistaken for uncoated but matte stocks actually do have a coating on them. It's a slight sheen. So I like to think that matte coatings are perfect for pastel colors, watercolors, artistic books, photography books. It's a really great professional look to it. And then the last one is gloss stocks. And gloss stocks are great in that if you have bright colors in your book, those colors are going to pop because there's a really high sheen to it. So great option for children's books too, especially if you have like bright neon colors. The only problem with gloss and matte stocks is they're not as ideal to writing on. So just something to keep in mind. And then the next one, part of the paper is the thickness of it, which it can be very difficult to kind of, there's a lot of different terms for it. But, you know, if you want something that you're just going to an employee handbook, you're going to hand to someone, they're going to put in their backpack, call a day, then you go with something lighter. So 50 pounds. But if you like a children's book where, you know, kids can be so tough on those books, you're going to want to go with something thicker that it's not going to be terrible as much, tear as easily. So, you know, and, you know, there's different in-betweens there. You're trying to save some money. I would typically recommend a hundred pound for a children's book. Like I said, it's a little bit thicker, not quite a card stock, but if you are looking for some cost savings, 80 pound, which is the next notch down, great option. The average person probably isn't going to notice that either. So, you know, but if you were to go down to like a 50 pound that I wouldn't suggest as much. But yeah, there, you can definitely explore some different routes there, especially if you are trying to save some money. How kind of we work here is everything's custom. Your book would be different than someone else's book. So it's based off all these specifics. So what paper size, quantity, a big one. And then at that point, we have a whole estimating department that takes all this together. And then they calculate that is a custom order. So I wouldn't be able to like rattle off a price, unfortunately, but I'm happy to get a quotes going for you. We have quick turnarounds on quotes these days. 
The last part on the checklist is bindery. There's tons of different binding styles out there. First off, I'll start with saddle stitching. That's where you have the staples. You have staples on the side here where it's creased. Great option if you want to save some money. Cost effective, really good option. Some other options out there are spiral binding or wiro binding. I'm sure you guys have seen stuff like this. Great for workbooks. You know, it's perfect option if you want something to lay flat. But I would say most with the children's books realm, we have our soft cover and our hard cover books. So soft covers, we can do perfect binding and you can do as small of a spine here, or you can go as big of a spine like a novel like this. So you, know, you can have text on the spine too. These are great options, very common. And then we have our hardcover books. So there you go, case bound books. You can put spine on there. And these are really popular. I would say these are one of our sweet spots, really good options. And then with these type of bindings, the minimums we can do on the soft covers is 50. And then the minimum on the hard covers would be 25. Like a lot of the books you would see like at Barnes and Nobles, they're glued right here, you know, along the spine to keep it all intact. Great to have, but especially on the hard covers, here's a few different options where it's not just glued. So the pages, the book blocks, so the pages themselves are glued together, but they're also sewn. So we have a side sewn feature, which is great on kind of like the, the quantities below, I would say 500, 1,000 or 500. It's great and cost effective. On the higher clients, I would say above a thousand, that's where you get into the smice zone, which, you know, it, it requires more like signature styles, but we do have different options available. And it all also depends on the other specs of your project too, to see if those different routes are possible. So that kind of covers my checklist. So on the covers, especially the hard covers, we have some like upgrade features that you can do to really make your cover pop. One thing with the hard covers is we always laminate them. So you can do a matte lamination, a gloss lamination, or a soft touch matte lamination. So this soft touch matte is gonna be kind of like a velvety feel to it. So you can more feel that lamination on there. The gloss and matte have a little bit more smoother feel to it. But on top of those things, what we can also do is foils on top of the cover. So here's instance where we did kind of like a silver foil and it's over a matte lamination. So you always want to make the glossy foil on the mat so it really pops there. And then another option is a spot gloss UV. So if you just want to kind of like an area that's clear coated and then the rest isn't. Mine is the spot gloss, I think. I yes. think that, that same kind of thing. Yep. Yep. So those are great options. Yeah, you know, those do add up eventually. So, you know, if you want to do one or the other, totally possible. I just would always recommend doing some of these upgrades on a matte cover. So it pops for you. With the nature of the hard cover and then the soft cover, perfect bound books or glued books and sewn books is that you can get stuff lost in the spine. It's the nature of the binding itself. With the side sewn feature itself, Imagine if this book went through a giant sewing machine right here. So it all they're all glued together. And then you open the book, it may not get all the way to the very edge of the spine there. So you do lose a lot. Not a lot. You lose about a quarter of an inch there. But it's something to think about when setting up your artwork. You're not going to want to put your paragraph right on the bound edge there. You know, could run into issues of it getting cut off in the spine. That would not be good. So there are some things to keep in mind and we do have guidelines and we're always building onto those guidelines, you know, as we progress. So we'll send that to you, you know, if you were ready to move forward and such. The side stitch, let me see if I find one, kind of has a different look to it. I'm not sure if you'll be able to see too much. It kind of, you can almost see a little bit of the stitching there. It's like right here in the crease. Yeah, I can see that. See, it's, it's subtle. It's there. But, you know, it's really for the durability of the book. I th It keeps the, those pages together. Um, it's just an extra something that we do to make sure the book stays complete in its own. Those are made up of signatures 
that basically you take a bunch of large sheets that are then folded together and then those are sewn together in different portions so you have a set that's sewn set that's sewn and then it's bound into the book so it's just a different type of sewing because it's more for the higher quantity routes i think both are great options but they do have kind of different looks to them is there one that's better than another is it just more on the quantities you'd go with one if you've got more quantity and then another if, if you don't pretty much i would say yeah if you go below a thousand you your the side stones the route to go above that the other ones the route to go Kelly's wondering regarding white versus cream paper is there a difference in the spine thickness between the two even though they're the same sheet thickness like 60 pound it shouldn't be for the most part and we can provide that spine width for you the cream paper is a little bit more expensive because it's not as common in bulk it's definitely an option overall it should be about the same spine width but that's definitely something you want to confirm with your artwork set up yeah she's saying specifically for hardcover yeah i would say same situation it should be about the same throughout double check the brand that it is the brand of paper it is and it's again something we could provide for you how common is the eight and a half by 11 size books. They're pretty common, maybe not so much for children's books, but they, I would say we do run across them. Very common for like workbooks, saddle stitch books across that realm more, but it's fairly up there in the most common sizes. Yeah, and I do see like most of my children's book authors are typically doing the eight and a half by eight and a half, but then there's a number of them that do six by nine, like chapter books that are smaller. Eight and a half by 11 is a really nice size that feels more substantial than like a little six by nine book. But and it depends, I think, on the target age group. I would look at, are you, you know, doing something for kids and for parents and kids to share reading? Or is it something that you want like kids to throw in their backpack? And there, it's the older age kids that a six by nine or a five by seven, five by eight is better. And it's more at that age, they start to go, oh, I don't want a baby book. I don't want the big ones. I want like the small ones like I'm getting in the library or at school being assigned to me. So they they start picture, you know, talking about how those picture books are the baby books and they want the different size and they kind of lean towards those. So think about your audience, take a look at some of your competitors when it comes to really choosing the right size for your book. It can be cost, can be one factor. What are your competitors doing? How are they selling? And also your market. If, if you know, if I'm doing something for third or fourth graders, I would definitely be thinking more along the lines of six by nine or those smaller books, because that's more what they expect. One of the things that when I, I had other printers in and talking about their stuff a couple of years back, they talked about digital printing versus offset printing. Could you explain to us what kind of printing you do and what is the difference between the digital and offset? Yeah, so we can do all those. The digital option is kind of how you would think of like pressing start on the printer. That's how you would envision it. The issue with digital is that it lays down toner. So it's just sitting on top of the paper, which is not ideal. What is ideal in the printing world is ink. So that ink is absorbed. And that's what's done with the offset. And then we have indigo presses that do that. So it's like absorbed into the paper, which is what everybody wants. So when you say you do both, is there a difference? If I said to you, I want my new book, you know, give me a quote. Would I say quote me on digital versus offset? Yeah. So with the children's book, we'll almost always do the offset or the indigo presses. So the indigo presses, it's digital in the sense that it has a very quick turnaround very quick compared to most printers, I would say, but it does lay that ink down. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. And that's where we prioritize the children's books on. So if, if it's not a children's book and you, you know, you just let me know and 
we will prioritize that on that specific press itself. Would it be less expensive if it's not a children's book? Because I do have some adult novels and fantasy novels that's mostly black and white pages. So for those situations, is digital a way of potentially saving some money? Yes, it is. Yep. And especially like just the black ink only, that is definitely a way you could save some money. Ariane's wondering, do you also do traditional offset printing where you smith sew the pages? Yes. Mm -hmm. Smith sew, what did you call it? Smith? Uh, yes, my sewn. Yeah. My sewn. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, we can absolutely do that. AJ says, could you repeat which type of binding is best for libraries? So I'm, I'm assuming libraries are going to get a lot of wear. The books are getting passed around. What is the most durable? Like I've seen sometimes it says library binding on like when you're looking at, on options of what to buy for hardcovers. I'm like, oh, that's different. They have a library binding versus a regular hardcover. I don't know which one and what the difference is. Can you kind of comment on that? I'd imagine most libraries would want a hardcover book or like a perfect bound book but something that's got a spine on it so that you can pick it out. Each user can go in and you know, point to that one and pick that one out. Without having like text on a spine, I'd imagine it could be hard to differentiate from the others. Okay, that is one thing that the libraries I know are very conscious of. They won't bring books in if it doesn't have the title and the author on the binding. So you're right there. And what's the strongest option if you knew you know, that the my target is to get into libraries and make sure that my book is going to be durable to be able to wear well for the library purposes. I would say it come down to maybe the page count of the book. So this, it's got a, about a 0.32 inch spine, but I, I can read the text. I can see the title. On the smaller, perfect bound books, you may not have a lot of pages. So I'm not able to, you know, we can't really put any text on that. So it's definitely something to consider in, if you are trying to get into the libraries then. So the, the perfect bound books are sewn and they actually do have glue on them too. So I would say the hardcover perfect bound books, either sewn options would be great for libraries. I have found that, you know, especially the children's books, kids will just press on those books so hard that you need almost a little extra something in there to keep that book blocked together. The sewn features definitely help. The side sewn is great. Like the lower quantities, I'd say maybe a thousand, 500 less, it's really cost effective. Once you get past that part, probably more my sewn would be more the route to go. It, you know, it can get on different presses then. Why is toner ink less quality than offset printing? And can you go over how much better my children's book will look with offset printing than my KDP printing? So uh, toner is, it's not ideal in some cases. It, it just sits on the paper. It can actually have like a, sh almost like a sheen to it too, because it's just sitting on top of the paper. And it's not ideal in the printing world, but it is a cost-effective route sometimes. Like I say, you sometimes just press print and it's super fast. I'm not sure exactly what KDP uses. Do we know if they if it's a digital production? I'm not sure, but the colors itself may appear differently than they would on an offset press. I have a two-part book which is it's all drawn and written and ready to go except I can't really print it with Amazon because it's weird. It's it's a book on well I, I won't tell you everything, but I'll just say that it requires two different books. The making of a book by this child, and you turn the book over, and it's a second book of the book that the child created with, you know, with for her teacher. So, written by Mr. Z, but really written by the, the young, the girl who's the protagonist. So, my question is, can, this is weird, I was going to leave it to the end or not even just do it privately, but no one else has this issue. <laughs> but can you create a book that will stop at page 32 and then a blank page and then you, you turn it upside down and start the, the second book um, from there? Is that possible or is that am I crazy? Yep, it's totally possible. And I think we've done one from the group before, Miss Sherry Wall. So pages what, one through 16 are one direction and then you kind of you can either flip the book over and then restart from the back 
or you can, you know, just switch it, you know, reverse it. Absolutely doable. And we do them all the time. If you are someone that is trying to just make sure that you are ready and that you want to prove your title, you can do print on demand, but that doesn't mean that you don't want to go and print a number of copies of your book so that when you go to events, you go and do, you know, you're you're going on school visits or you want to sell from your website, you want to do a book signing that, you know, actually printing some for yourself or for those purposes is still fine. And usually most authors will order a couple hundred copies. Some people order directly from Amazon or directly from Ingram Spark. What I found is that Kristen can get the price about the same or less than you can for those author copies and at a much higher quality. So if you are doing something, whether it's fulfilling Kickstarter or other, you know, purchasing those copies, get the best possible quality for yourself. And that's typically where I see where I'm constantly recommending Kristen and formats for that because they have that sweet spot of fewer books. You don't have to order thousands of copies or wait three months for them to come to you, you know, traveling on a slow ship from China, (laughs) a slow boat from China, right? So it can be really helpful to deal with small presses and small printers like Kristen or Max or your local printer as well. So given that kind of an overview of like how I recommend and why I'm always on the phone getting quotes or calling Kristen and saying, hey, what, can I check on this book or that book? That kind of gives Kristen a little bit of a head start with why, even if you're doing print on demand, you might want to go with a, a smaller print run. A lot of the authors that I've worked with, I recommend Kristen. That's why I wanted to bring her here. I will say that if you If you're trying to drive prices down as low as possible and you're considering China-based printing, which is an absolutely valid option, I tend to choose, I want US-based, so that's why I started searching for US-based printers, but just make sure you're planning well in advance because you do need to budget three to four months, I would say four months to actually get the books in hand. Because if there are delays or something gets stuck in transit or in customs, you just want to make sure that you're able to accommodate that. But it is by far the best way of getting your book prices down as low as possible and still, you know, with really great high quality. Kristen and her group have met just great pricing U.S.-based pricing in competitive with some of the others that I put there and actually usually end up being the lowest price and highest quality for those, that sweet spot of, you know, 500 or less kind of books. I've got quotes on large print runs, but it sounds to me, Kristen, like you are available to quote on those as well. Correct. And you are right. Like it's China pricing. We can't compete with that. It's great pricing. I'll I'll be honest, but we are US based here. We have fast turnarounds. It's not going to get stuck in customs. You know, it's easy to work with. So, you know, as you know, China is an option. But if you want to stay, you know, local here in the US, that is where we are. If you are getting ready, you know, you're looking to get some quotes together. Kristen, what's the best approach? Should they be emailing you? Is there an online quoting option? Where would you direct folks? What I would suggest is emailing me directly. That way you get it right away to me. You can always go through the quote form on the website. It does kind of just naturally take longer to get distributed. And then you could be rerouted to kind of a different department potentially. So if you could just email me or you can give me a call directly, I'm happy to hop on the phone and chat too. I'm back on next Wednesday. And you know, this is a great time to get together. You can get free answers to your questions. I'm here and I'm saying, ask me anything. Come on, tell me what you're struggling with and I'll help you. And uh, that's, uh, you know, my way of giving back to the author community. I love doing it. Do you guys like Zoom better than me just broadcasting. You guys would rather join. Okay, I'll do that. I'll I'll do the Zoom. It's great ability to connect as a group. Yes, so I will absolutely do that. Um, yeah, let's let's move that forward. 
So come back on Wednesdays and yeah, let's keep growing and sharing and going through this. If you've got ideas for topics for next week or for an upcoming session, send it along. Send it to my email, april at the little labradoodle.com. I'll throw that in there, but go to self-pub made simple.com. And if you're not on my mailing list, join it. 